Chapter 32 Hadassah was drawing water from the well in the peristyle when one of the slave girls came and said she was wanted in the master's chambers. Phoebe stood behind the couch on which Decimus reclined, her hand resting on his shoulder. His pale cheeks were sunken, his eyes enigmatic and watchful. Phoebe's gaze flickered to Hadassah's small harp. We didn't summon you to play for us, Hadassah, she said solemnly. We have questions to ask. Please sit. She gestured to a stool near the couch. Hadassah felt the cold chill of fear rush through her blood as she sat before them. Back straight, hands clasped on her lap, she waited. It was Decimus who spoke, his voice roughened by pain. Are you a Christian? Hadassah's heart fluttered like a fragile bird taking wing within her. A single spoken yes could mean her death. Her throat closed. You have nothing to fear from us, Hadassah, Phoebe said gently. What you tell us will go no farther than this room. You have our word. Please, we only want to know about this god of yours. Still frightened, she nodded. Yes, I'm a Christian. And all this time I thought you were a Jew, Phoebe said, amazed that Decimus had been right about her. My father and mother were from the tribe of Benjamin, my lady. Christians worshipped the god of Israel, but many Jews did not recognize the Messiah when he came. Decimus saw his son enter through the adjoining study. Marcus stopped when he saw Hadassah, a muscle moving in his jaw. Messiah, Phoebe said, not noticing him. What is this word, Messiah? Messiah means the anointed one, my lady. God came down in the form of man and lived among us. Hadassah held her breath and then said, His name is Jesus. Was, Marcus said, and entered the room. Hadassah tensed when he spoke. He saw her cheeks bloom with color, but she neither moved nor looked up. He gazed at the gentle curve of her neck and the soft strands of dark curling hair that lay against the nape of her neck. I've done some investigation on this Jewish sect over the past few weeks, Marcus said roughly. He had paid men to research the cult, and they had brought him the name of a retired Roman centurion who lived outside Ephesus. Marcus had ridden out to talk with him. He should have been pleased with what he learned, for it could shatter this faith that Asa had. Instead, he had been depressed for days, avoiding the moment when he would speak with her again. And now she was spreading this cancerous story to his own father and mother. This Jesus the Christians claim as their Messiah was a rebel crucified on a cross in Judea. Hadassah's faith is based on emotion rather than fact, on a desperation for answers to unanswerable questions, he said, directing his statements to his parents. He looked down at Hadassah then. Jesus wasn't a god, Hadassah. He was a man who made the mistake of defying the powers in Jerusalem and paid the price for it. He challenged the authority of the Sanhedrin as well as the Roman Empire. Just his name was enough to cause insurrection. It still is. But what if it's true, Marcus? His mother said. What if he is a god? He wasn't. According to Epinetus, a man I've met who saw what happened back then, he was a magician of some repute who performed signs and wonders in Judea. The Jews were hungry for a savior and were easily convinced he was their long-awaited Messiah. They expected him to expel the Romans from Judea, and when he didn't, his followers turned on him. One of his own disciples betrayed him to the high court. This Jesus was sent to Pontius Pilate. Pilate tried to free him, but the Jews themselves demanded he be crucified because he was what they termed a blasphemer. He died on a cross, was taken down and entombed, and that was the end of it. No, Hadassah said softly. He arose. Phoebe's eyes went wide. He came back to life? Marcus swore in frustration. No, he didn't, mother. Hadassah, listen to me. He knelt and turned her roughly to face him. It was his disciples who said he arose, but it was all a hoax planned to further the spread of this cult. Hadassah closed her eyes and shook her head. He shook her slightly. Yes. Epinages was in Judea when it happened. He's an old man now and lives near us outside the city. I'll take you to him if you don't believe me. You can hear the truth for yourself. He was one of the centurions at the tomb. He said the body was stolen in order to make people believe that there had been a resurrection. He saw this, Decimus said, wondering why his son was so determined to shatter the slave girl's precious faith. Marcus saw nothing change in her eyes. He let go of her and stood. Epinetus said he didn't see the body taken from the tomb, but that was the only logical explanation. Right from beneath the noses of Roman guards? Do you want to believe this ridiculous story? Marcus said angrily. I want to know the truth, Decimus said. How is it that Epinetus is still alive if he was a guard at the tomb? There's a death penalty for neglecting duty. 
Why wasn't he executed for failing in his? Marcus had asked the same question. He said Pilate was sick of being used by the Jewish factions. His wife had been tormented by dreams before this Jesus was brought to him, but the Sanhedrin and Jewish mob forced him to hand this Messiah of theirs over for crucifixion. Pilate washed his hands of the whole matter. He wanted no further involvement with these religious fanatics, and wasn't about to sacrifice good soldiers over the missing body of one unimportant dead Jew. It seems to me it would have been important to all concerned to make sure the body stayed in the tomb, Decimus said. He arose, Hadassah said again, calm before Marcus hurrying. The Lord appeared to Mary of Magdala and to his disciples. Who probably lied to keep the story of this Messiah going, Marcus retorted. The Lord also appeared to more than five hundred others at one time, Hadassah went on. Marcus saw his mother's desperate hope for anything that might help his father. She had put her faith in gods and goddesses, in physicians and priests, in spiritualists and healers, and all any of them had done was sap his father's strength. Mother, don't put yourself through this. It's a lie perpetuated by self-serving men. Hadassah turned slightly on her stool and looked up at him. Her father self-serving, John and all the rest. She thought of her father going out into the streets of Jerusalem to speak the truth. Why? She had cried out to him. Why? And now, as she looked at Decimus, Phoebe, and Marcus, and saw suffering, despair, and disillusionment, she knew how wrong Marcus was about everything. What reason did they have to lie? She said gently. Money, power, the esteem of men, Marcus said, thinking he might finally break through to her and open her eyes. Those are reasons for many men to lie. Do you believe I would lie to you? He softened. He wanted to kneel down and take her hands and tell her he was sorry to hurt her. He wanted to protect her. He wanted to love her. He wanted her for himself. But her faith in this non-existent God stood between them. No, he said bleakly. I don't think you'd lie to me. I don't think you are capable of lying to anyone. I think you believe every word of this wild story because you were raised to believe it. It was drummed into you from the time you were born. But it's not true. She shook her head. Oh, Marcus, she said sadly. You are so wrong. It is true. Jesus arose. He's alive. She pressed her clasped hands to her chest. He's here. He's dead, Marcus said in frustration. Why won't you listen to the facts? What facts? The word of a guard who saw nothing? What did the men who followed Jesus gain? Not money or power or the esteem of men. They were reviled as the Lord was reviled. James was beheaded by King Herod Agrippa. Andrew was stoned in Scythia. Bartholomew was flayed alive and beheaded in Armenia. Matthew was crucified in Alexandria. Philip in Hierapolis, Peter in Rome. James the last was beheaded by order of Herod Antipas. Simon the Zealot was sawn in two in Persia, and none of them recanted. Even in the face of death, they still proclaimed Jesus the Messiah. Would they all have died like that to preserve a lie? My father told me they were all afraid when Jesus was crucified. They ran away and hid. After Jesus arose and came to them, they were different men, changed, not from without, but from within, Marcus. They spread the good news because they knew it was true. What is the good news? Phoebe asked, trembling. That the Lord came, not to condemn the world, but to save it, my lady. He is the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in him shall live, even if he dies. On Mount Olympus with all the other deities, I suppose, Marcus said scathingly. Marcus, Phoebe said, embarrassed by his mockery. Marcus looked to his father. Hadass is right about one thing. Speaking of this Messiah does bring suffering and death. Her own, if she persists. This Jesus preached that man answers to God alone, and not to any Caesar. If she helps spread this religion, she'll end up in the arena. Hadassah was deathly pale. Jesus said, Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and to God that which is God's. And by your own words, everything you are, everything you do is in the service to this God of yours. Isn't that so? He owns you. Marcus, Phoebe said, disturbed by her son's intensity. Why do you attack her so? She didn't come to us to speak of her God. We summoned her here to ask her for ourselves. Then leave well enough alone, mother. Leave her God unseen and forgotten, he said. Her faith is based on a God who doesn't exist and on an event that never happened. Silence fell over them. Hadassah spoke into it, like an echo in the canyons of their minds, a flicker of light in the darkness. Jesus raised my father from the dead. What did you say? Phoebe whispered. Hadassah raised her eyes. Jesus raised my father from the dead, she said again. 
No waver in her voice this time. But how? I don't know, my lady. Decimus sat forward slightly. You saw this happen with your own eyes. It happened before I was born, in Jerusalem. Hadassah, Marcus said, trying to curb his exasperation. You only have the word of others that he did such a deed. Hadassah looked up, all the love she had for him revealed. Nothing I can say will ever convince you, Marcus. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. But I know Jesus arose. I feel his presence now, here, with me. I see the evidence of his word every day. From creation forth, the whole world is witness to God's plan, revealed through his Son. From the beginning, he prepared us. In the passing of the seasons, in the way the flowers spring forth, die, and drop seeds for life to begin anew, in the sunrise and sunset, Jesus' sacrifice is reenacted every day of our lives if we but have the eyes to see. But can't you see? That's simply the natural order of things. No, Marcus. That's God speaking to all mankind, and he will return. Your faith is blind. Hadassah looked at Decimus. If you stare into the sun and look away, you see the sun, my lord. If you stare at death, you see death. Where does hope lie? His eyes flickered. He leaned back slowly. I have no hope. Marcus turned. He saw the dullness in his father's eyes, the pain etched into his face. Marcus was suddenly filled with deep shame. Perhaps he had been wrong. Maybe it was better to have false hope than no hope at all. You may go, Hadassah, Phoebe said, stroking Decimus' shoulder in futile comfort. For the first time, Hadassah did not obey a command. She knelt beside the couch and broke every unspoken law by taking her master's hand in both of hers. Then she did the unforgivable by looking straight into Decimus' eyes and speaking to him as an equal. My lord, to accept God's grace is to live with hope. If you but confess your sins and believe, the Lord will forgive you. Ask, and he will come to dwell in your heart, and you will have the peace you crave. You only have to believe. Decimus saw love in her eyes, the kind of love he had always longed to have from his own daughter. Her plain features and brown eyes were alight with the warmth that came from within and for a moment he saw the beauty his son wanted to possess. She believed the incredible. She believed the impossible. Not with stubbornness and pride, but with a pure, childlike innocence the world had been unable to mar. And without thought of the risk to herself, she offered her own hope to him if he could accept it. He might not believe anything of what she said. He might not be able to believe in this unseen God of hers, but he believed in her. Smiling sadly, he laid his other hand against her cheek, but for Julia, I would set you free. She squeezed his hand tenderly. I am free, my lord, she whispered. You can be free, too. She rose gracefully and left the room, closing the door quietly behind her. Atreides stepped up into the chariot and braced himself for the pompa, or opening ceremonies, to begin. His gold and silver chest armor and helmet were heavy and hot, even though it was early morning. He flipped the red cape back over his shoulders and shifted so he could see the other gladiators making ready for the presentation. There were twenty-four in all. He'd have to kill five to earn his freedom. Certes had arranged for a broad mix this time. The chariots lined up carrying Damachari, men armed with daggers, Samnites with glad iron shields, Velites, gladiators who fought with javelins, and Sagittari, those armed with bows and arrows. There were four Esadari, combatants who rode in their own decorated two-horse chariots, followed by another three and abate, who were astride powerful, trained war horses, and who wore helmets with closed visors, which meant they basically fought blindfolded. And the chariot just behind Atreides was an African Racharius, his trident and net displayed. The mob would be pleased by the mindery. The priests are coming out, Atreides' driver said, looping the reins expertly between his fingers. Atreides had seen the priests, dressed in white tunics and red scarves, leading a white bull and two rams with golden headdresses for the sacrifice. They read the entrails to be sure this was a good day for the games. Atreides' mouth curved cynically, knowing that any day was a good day for the games. No priest would dare call them off, no matter what bad omen he saw in the bloody viscera. Trumpets blared and the doors opened. There we go, the driver said as he drew into line behind the Roman officials and promoters who financed the games. Certes was just ahead of Atreides. The mob screamed wildly. Atreides heard his own name cried out over and over, as well as the names of a half-dozen others. His fame was not as great in Ephesus as it had been in Rome, but he didn't care. He focused all thought on what lay ahead, 
counting the other gladiators and assessing their merit as he was driven around the arena for spectators to see. Only once did his attention wander. As he passed the box where the proconsul sat, he glanced up and scanned the guests with the politician. Julia was among them. She was wearing the red palace she had worn to the Temple of Artemis. His heart quickened at the sight of her. And then he looked away. He would not look at her again until the games were over. The chariots made several more circles about the arena and then drew up in a line before the proconsul. The gladiators stepped down and paraded, some removing their capes, and others, to the, to the delight of the crowd, removing everything. Atreides did neither. He stood, feet planted slightly apart, his hand on his sword, and waited. When the others finished their preening for the mob and joined the formation, Atreides drew his gladius and held it up with the others. Hail Caesar, those who are about to die, salute you. The proconsul began a brief speech. Atreides kept his eyes from Julia, looking instead for the strange little slave. She was in attendance. The crowd roared in approval as the proconsul officially opened the games. Atreides and the others stepped up into the chariots again, and the drivers laid on the whips until the chariots raced one last time around the arena, and then sped out the gate to the wild shouting of the mob. In the holding room, it was cool and deeply shadowed, and the smell of lamp oil was strong. Iron-grated windows were high in the stone walls. No one spoke. Atreides removed his fancy armor and donned a simple brown tunic. It would be hours before any of them fought. At the feast the night before, Certes had read to them the Libellus, the program listing the coming events. The pompa would be concluded by the proconsul dedicating the games to the emperor. Following would be a grand parade opening and speeches, and then acrobats and trick riders would perform, followed by the dog races. Next, two robbers would be crucified, and Molossian hounds would tear them down from the crosses. Then hunters, or bestari, would hunt Nandi bears from the Aberde mountains of Kenya, followed by prisoners being fed to a pride of European lions. Sometime near the middle of the day, a brief hour-long respite from the carnage would occur, during which the arena would be cleared and fresh sand brought in. Food would be distributed, lottery tickets sold, and bedroom farces performed. However, these entertainments always palled swiftly on a mob hungry for the narcotic of blood and violence. The big match was planned for late afternoon. Fear coiled in Atreides' belly. Twelve pairs of gladiators. The most men he had faced in a single day had been three. Today he would have to kill five, one right after another, if he were to survive. However, none of the men he would face worried him so much as the long wait. That was his worst enemy, for it was during the hours before the fighting that every hope and every fear rippled through his mind, until he thought he would go mad. Julia's palms perspired, and she had trouble concentrating on what the proconsul was saying. She wasn't interested in politics or economics. All she could think about was Atreides and the fact that he might die today. She hadn't seen him since their argument a week before. She had wanted to send Hadassah to bring him to her, but was afraid he would still be angry and refuse. So she had waited, hoping he would send word to her. When he hadn't, she had swallowed her pride and gone to the temple, hoping for a glimpse of him. He hadn't come. When he had entered the arena for the pompa, her heart had raced at the sight of him. As the gladiators had drawn up before the proconsul and he had stepped down, she'd waited for him to look at her. She had spent hours preparing herself and knew she looked more beautiful than ever before. But not once had she seen his head turn in her direction. He had stood still, head high, while the others strutted like peacocks before the crowd. See how he ignores you, Caliba had said disdainfully, with all these others screaming for him. Why should he care that he's broken your heart? Atreides! Atreides! Men and women cried out, tossing flowers and coins down to him. The memory refueled her hurt and jealousy, and Julia pressed her lips together, her thoughts poisoned by Caliba's taunt. Primus lounged nearby, evaluating the gladiators they had seen with the skill of a connoisseur. I'll wager all the German, he said, and popped a round purple grape into his mouth. Five hundred sestresses on the African! another man said, indicating a tall, powerful-looking Veles. Ha! Neither will have a chance against an Asidarius. What good is a sword against a chariot? Someone else retorted. Surely they won't pit an Asidarius against a Samnite, Julia said in alarm. Not to begin with, but don't forget this is an elimination match, Primus said. They'll pair what's left. Lachiarius against Samnite, and Abadda against Radarius, Darshan against Mermillo. You saw that they have some of each type here for the games, the best in each class. 
That's what makes it exciting. Those trained to face the sword may be forced to face a javelin instead. The victor is less predictable that way. Heart pounding, Julia felt sudden fear for Atreides. In silence, she beseeched the gods to let him survive. She willed herself to relax and enjoy the refreshments and conversation. Primus was quite amusing and seemed intent upon entertaining her. She grew annoyed watching the robbers hang on their crosses. Why don't they set the Molossians loose on them and have done with this? It's taking too long. Such a thirst for blood, Primus said, amused. Come, Julia, I'll take you down to the booths and we'll see what catches your fancy. Restless and tense with waiting, Julia swiftly agreed. She went up the steps, her hand on Primus' arm. Hawkers shifted by them, carrying boxes laden with fruit, sausages, bread, and skins of wine. Fires and peaches, succulents and ripe! Their staccato shouting mingled with the rolling thunder of the mob. Spicy sausages! Three for our sestress! Other spectators, bored with watching men hanging from crosses, milled about under the stands, looking for excitement. With Primus beside her, Julia wandered the booths of astrology, fortune tellers, souvenir, and food vendors. Soon they came to stalls where more lewd and unusual entertainments were taking place. Small painted boys, with tunics hitched above their buttocks, moved about the milling customers. Primus watched them grimly. Prometheus was such as these until I rescued him. Uncomfortable at the mention of Primus Catamite, Julia remained silent. She stopped to watch Moorish dancers undulating to the primitive beat of drums and cymbals. Caliba has spoken with you about my offer, Prima said, half questioning. Yes, Julia said bleakly. I've given it much thought. Have you made a decision? I'll tell you when the games are over. It's done, Sergei said, and a hot rush swept through Atreides' blood, accelerating his heartbeat and heating his skin. He pulled the manica, a leather and metal scaled glove, over his right arm. I'd have preferred owning you a few more years to having you wasted like this, Sirdes said grimly. Perhaps the goddess will smile on me today and I will gain my freedom, Atreides said, pulling on the okria, another protective covering, over his left leg. For a gladiator, freedom is another word for obscurity. Sirdes handed him his scutum, a simple shield. Atreides slipped his left arm into the metal braces at the back of the scutum and stood with his arms extended outward and his legs splayed. A slave rubbed his exposed body with olive oil. Obscurity is preferable to bondage, Atreides said, staring coldly into Sirde's eyes. Ah, uh, Sirde said, but not the death. He held out the gladius. Atreides took it and held it up before his face in a salute of respect. Either way, Sirdes, today I leave the arena victorious. Alakiarius, on foot and armed with his rope, was matched against an Esidarius and his chariot. The Esidarius sent the chariot careening past the Lacrearius several times. Though he failed to run his opponent down, he did manage to dodge the lasso. On the eighth pass, however, the Lacrearius looped his rope over the Esidarius, and then set his feet and catapulted the man straight off the back of the speeding chariot. The Esidarius hit the ground and his neck snapped, drawing a groan of disappointment from the crowd. Without the chariot driver, the animals kept running and the chariot went round and round the arena. Several slaves were sent out to capture and calm the stallions, while a man dressed in a close-fitting tunic and high leather boots danced out onto the sand. He was representative of Sharon, the boatsman who ferried the souls of the dead across the Styx to Hades. As he approached the victim, he spun and leapt across the sand, holding a mallet high in one hand. The beaked mask he wore resembled a bird of prey. Another man dressed as Hermes, another guide for the souls of the dead, brandished a red-hot Cadassius, with which he prodded the fallen Esidarius. When the body twitched, Sharon leaped in and brought down the warhammer on the man's head, spraying a crimson stain across the sand and assuring Hades of its prey. The Libitinari, as the two guides were called, quickly bore the corpse through the gate of the dead. A dark sound moved like a wave through the thousands of spectators. They grumbled that the match had ended too quickly. They felt cheated. Some booed the victor. Others threw fruit at him as he held his hand up to the proconsul in salute. He received the signal to withdraw, but didn't depart quickly enough, for spectators began shouting for him to be matched with the tall African bellies. Let's see what a Lachiarius could do against a man with a javelin! Sensitive to the whim of the mob, the proconsul raised his hand slightly to the editor of the games, and the African entered the arena before the Lachiarius could leave. They circled one another for several minutes. 
during which the Lachiarius tossed his rope several times and missed. The Veles jabbed at him with the javelin, but kept a cautious distance. The crowd yelled in anger. Things were going too slowly. Hearing the spectators' discontent and recognizing it as a threat, the Lachiarius threw his rope again and hit the Veles across the chest. Swiftly, the African caught hold of the rope, looped it around his arm, and threw his javelin, sending it straight through his opponent's abdomen. The Lachiarius dropped to his knees, hunching over the spear. Tossing the rope aside, the African strode toward him to finish him off when given the pulley's verso, thumbs down. The proconsul glanced around and saw thumbs turning down everywhere he looked. He put his hand out and turned his thumb down as well. The valets yanked the javelin from the Lachiarius' abdomen and rammed it through his heart. They aren't getting what they want, Serte said to Atreides from where he watched. Listen to them. If it continues like this, they'll want the proconsul thrown to the dogs. The valets triumphed over the fishman, or Mermillo, but fell to the Sagittarius' bow and arrows. The Sagittarius fought well against an Anabata, who was on horseback, but lost his footing when he wounded the rider, and fell beneath the pounding hooves of the warhorse. Charon dispatched both of them, and the mob roared its approval. Bring them all in at once! Someone shouted at the proconsul, and the cry was taken up by others until it became a chant. All at once! All at once! Responding to the whim, the remaining eighteen gladiators were paired off and sent into the arena. They spread out and raised their weapons to the proconsul. The spectators went wild, shouting the names of their favorites. Atreides was matched against a swarthy, black-eyed Thracian, who was armed with a scimitar. Grinning arrogantly, the Thracian swung his weapon around in a theatrical swordplay. He twirled his sword from one side of his body to the other and over his head, and then stopped, feet spread. Standing in a deceptively relaxed pose, Atreides spit on the sand. The crowd laughed. Enraged, the Thracian charged. Atreides ducked the deadly swing of the scimitar, rammed his scutum into his opponent, and brought the hilt of his gladius down across the side of the man's head, then plunged it into the Thracian's breastplate. Yanking the gladius free, he let the already dead man fall back. Charning, he saw Retiarius using his trident to spear a fallen cicator, whose fish-crested helmet offered him little protection. Atreides strode toward the victor purposefully, aware of the swelling sound of his followers. The Retarius yanked his trident free and tried to retrieve his tangled net before Atreides reached him. Atreides charged, and the Retarius managed to block his first and second blow. But, without his net, Atreides' opponent had only the trident to defend himself, and the German's years of experience with the Fermea gave him the advantage. With brute force, Atreides battered the Retarius with Scudam and Gladius until he found an opening. He took it. The crowd screamed wildly, and his name sounded like a drumbeat. But in Atreides' own mind... The cry was, Freedom! 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 Before the Retarius had fallen, a searing pain burst along Atreides' side as the Dimacarius dagger glanced off his ribcage. He stumbled back, blocking a frontal attack with a scutum. Regaining his balance, he uttered a cry of pain and rage. No foul little backstabber was going to take this chance from him. He swung his gladius with all his strength and bent the Dimacarius' shield in half, knocking him to his knees. Dropping the now useless scutum, the man scrambled to his feet and ran, knowing his dagger was no match against the gladius. To the glee of the crowd, Atreides ran after him. As he did so, he bent and snatched up the fallen Retarius trident, took a hopping step, and hurled it with a skill he had learned in using the Pamea. The mob went wild when the trident hit its mark. Men stood and pounded on those in front of them. Women screamed in mad abandon. Some fainted, overcome with excitement while others tore out their clothes and hair and jumped up and down. The earth beneath the stadium trembled. Atreides! 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 Atreides caught their bloodlust and let it rain. He cut down a mermillo and attacked the sand knight. He unleashed his rage against Rome, allowing hatred to pump through him, sending the strength he needed surging through his wounded body. Knocking the scutum from his opponent's arm, he gutted him like a fish. Turning, he looked for whoever stood between him and his freedom. Thousands of spectators were on their feet, waving white banners and chanting. It was a moment before Atreides' mind cleared, and he realized what the mob screamed so loudly. Atreides! 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 He was the last man standing. Julia trembled violently as Atreides walked toward a gateway that opened to the stairs he would climb to the platform where the proconsul waited to award the victor. She was torn between jubilation and fear. She loved him and was proud of his triumph 
but she knew his newly won freedom would jeopardize her own liberty. As the Trades walked toward the stairs, he stumbled and fell to one knee. The crowd gasped and grew quiet, but he used his gladius and pushed himself up again. The crowd cheered wildly as he reached the gate to the victor's platform, where a soldier opened it for him and drew back in respect as he ascended the stone steps. The proconsul was waiting, a laurel wreath of victory, an ivory pendant, and a wooden sword in his arms. Julia scarcely heard what the proconsul said as he placed the laurel wreath on Atreides' head. Then the politician's daughter looped the small rectangular ivory pendant proclaiming Atreides' freedom around his neck. Jealousy swept like a hot flood through Julia as the girl pulled Atreides' head down to kiss him full on the mouth. Women screamed ecstatically around her, and Julia wanted to press her hands over her ears and turn away. Certes handed Atreides the wooden sword, proclaiming his triumphant retirement from the arena, and two soldiers deposited a chest of cestresses at Atreides' feet. The proconsul raised his hand to the cheering masses. Within a moment, the stadium went quiet. Thousands craned forward to hear what reward would be given to the triumphant victor next. We have one last honor to bestow upon our beloved Atreides for his victory today, the proconsul called out. He turned dramatically and took a scroll from Serde's hand. I bestow this by order of Emperor Vespasian, he called out and extended the scroll to Atreides, who accepted it mechanically. The proconsul put his hand on Atreides' shoulder and turned him to face the thousands, proclaiming, Atreides is hereby made a citizen and defender of Rome. Atreides stiffened briefly, his face going pale and taut with violent emotions. Julia saw his fist clench at the proclamation. See how he hates Rome, Caliba said, leaning close to Julia as the mob cheered in adoration. He would throw that proclamation in the dust if it didn't give him everything he wants. Caliba's words blended with the cries of the mob as they began shouting his name again and again. He stands as equal with your father and brother now. Atreides turned his head, seeking Julia out among the proconsul's guests. He looked straight into her eyes, his own blazing with promise, which made her heart race. For one terrifying moment, she thought he meant to claim her right then and there. Instead, Certes and several Roman guards escorted him down the steps, across the arena, and to the door of life, inside which his wounds would be tended. Primus helped Julia to her feet. You're shaking, he said with a knowing smile. But then, I imagine every woman in the stadium is trembling at the sight of him. He is magnificent. Yes, he is, she said, remembering the look in his eyes. Now that he had his freedom, what was to keep him from trying to make her his slave? Her mouth went dry. Primus lifted her easily into the canopied litter so that she could be borne aloft by six of his slaves. Before he drew the curtains closed, he tipped his head and gave her a faint but charming smile. So, what have you decided? Julia's stomach tightened until it hurt. When she spoke, her voice was flat. I'll sign the agreement this evening and have my things brought to your villa tomorrow morning. How very wise of you, Julia, Calba exclaimed from behind Primus, her eyes gleaming. Primus took Julia's hand and kissed it. As he drew the curtains closed, she leaned back and closed her eyes, wondering why she suddenly felt so desolate. 